Hi, this is Brett from Indiana, and you're listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Hey everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. I am on with my co-host Sophie. Hey Sophie. Hey Kelly. And we are joined tonight by Charlotte Clymer, who is a writer and is on the Human Rights Commission communications team. Hi Charlotte. Hey, how y'all doing? Yeah, we're doing great. Thanks so much for joining us. We've been talking about having you on the podcast for a while, so I'm glad we could finally make this work. Me too. So, Charlotte, for any of our listeners who are maybe somehow not yet on Twitter, which is where (laughs) I know everybody from, and I don't know how anyone could listen to us and listen to me talk at length about Twitter and not go on Twitter, but just in case they aren't and haven't run across you before, could you give a little bit of just sort of background about your story? Sure. Well, I am the press secretary for Rapid Response at the Human Rights Campaign, which is the nation's largest LGBTQ organization. And my day-to-day job is basically crafting our political messaging on anything related to the Trump White House and federal policy. So we don't just work on LGBTQ issues. We also work on everything that intersects with that, which, you know, could be the rights of undocumented immigrants or reproductive health or voting rights. We do this wide swath of issues. When I'm not at the Human Rights Campaign, I'm probably ranting on Twitter, where I've been ranting for quite a long time now. And I am a writer outside of that. So before I joined HRC, I was a freelance writer. I did pieces for GQ, Washington Post, Huffington Post, of course, just several uh, outlets. And I think that what folks most know me for is just ranting on social justice issues in general. I am a proud transgender woman, and that doesn't define all of who I am, but it's a pretty big piece of me. I'm also from Texas. I'm a military veteran. I have a lot of aspects of my background that mostly align with the conservative movement, but I'm not a conservative. And so I think that is something that interests a lot of people. And it gives me not a unique perspective, but certainly a far less common perspective on political topics. And one story that I sort of caught national attention fairly recently, I believe over the summer, was an experience that you had in a, I believe it was a bar in DC where you live. And it looks like that maybe uh, came to some sort of conclusion recently. Could you talk a little bit about that? I did. I was at my first ever bachelorette party for a good friend of mine. And we were having a great time. We went to this restaurant in downtown DC, just kind of partying the night away. And near the end of our evening, I went to use the restroom with a friend and I got stopped at the door to the restroom, the women's restroom, by this attendant who asked to see my ID. He didn't ask anybody else. And of course, I said, no, absolutely not. Just went inside the restroom anyway to use it. And he went in after me and started searching all the stalls to find me, which was a bit of tragic irony there. To make a long story short, the staff, including the manager, essentially wanted to force me to show my ID to use the restroom. When I brought up D.C. law and the actual text of D.C. law on my phone to show them that that's illegal and that, you know, gender identity and trans folks in D.C. have full rights, he denied knowing it existed. Uh, He said I was lying. And then he had a bouncer throw me out of the restaurant, physically grab me and throw me out of the restaurant. So I thought about what to do. I was kind of at a loss. And after a lot of internal debate, I decided to call the cops, which is not something I like doing or something I, you know, really think is a solution to most problems out there. But in this particular situation, I felt it, you know, warranted. The cops responded. They were, they were incredibly professional. Uh, they knew D.C. law. They told the manager that he was, you know, in the wrong and what he did was illegal. Well, I filed a complaint with the D.C. Office of Human Rights, and they investigated the incident, and they brought us to a mediation. I got to say, the CEO of the company was really fair-minded. He recognized where the company went wrong. He pledged to do better. He revamped all the rules and regulations for his restaurants, 
ensuring that they were fully LGBTQ inclusive. And he made a large donation to Costa Ruby, which is an LGBTQ organization here in D.C. And so overall, it was a happy ending to a really, really not so great incident. But the thing is that for most LGBTQ people in this country, they don't have that happy ending. You know, I live in D.C. where trans people have full equality, but most LGBTQ people live in parts of the country where their gender identity or their sexual orientation does not have protection from discrimination, either in the private or the public space. It's, it's interesting because, you know, with the legalization of marriage equality, a lot of people, I think, thought that the movement for gay rights was over. Um, and LGBTQ rights in general. But in fact, it's it's far from over. I mean, in 28 states, you can still be fired for being gay or lesbian um, or bisexual. In 30 states, you could be fired for being transgender. That means that your employer can come to you and say, you're gay, and because of that, I fire you or I want to fire you. And that's totally legal. And it astonishes me that most Americans don't know that. In, I think, 10 states, it's permissible for adoption agencies to discriminate against LGBTQ couples. So they can keep a child from going to an LGBTQ home because the, you know, adopted parent or the prospective adoptive parents are LGBTQ. I mean, there are so many issues like this that we don't talk about. And under this administration, those attacks have just escalated. So are most of these things, things that are governed by state law? I mean, that's what it sounds like. You know, if, if the the different states are, are treating things differently, is there anything that is governed by or protected by federal law, or does everything like this come down to the states? Well, I'm glad you asked that. We don't have any broad protection at the federal level against um, discrimination, which is why in this upcoming legislative session, Democrats are going to introduce or reintroduce something called the Equality Act which would federalize civil rights protections for LGBTQ people at the federal level if it were passed, ensuring that LGBTQ people can be discriminated against in restaurants or schools or, for example, trans people told they can't serve in the military. All these issues that we're seeing uh, in which LGBTQ people are needlessly and cruelly discriminated against would be blunted and uh, mostly erased by this act. But no, by and large, it is a state-by-state basis. You know, LGBTQ people uh, are not technically a protected class. It often falls under gender, which not to get too technical here, is what's called uh, intermediate um, class, according to the Supreme Court. It's not strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny means that, you know, like race, for example, all discrimination on the basis of race, totally legal. Intermediate scrutiny uh, allows for a lot of wiggle room with that. So even under that, LGBTQ people do not have uh, ironclad rights under Supreme Court precedent. So if Democrats are going to reintroduce the Equality Act, I mean, it seems like we would have a large enough majority in the House to to pass such a bill, although, you know, there's always the question of what some Democrats may vote on. But then what would happen? Would it likely just go to the Senate and not even be brought for a vote? Do you, do you have any sense of what might happen there? Well, here's the great thing about the House passing it, and they will pass it. It would introduce it into the national conversation, and it would force Republicans to, you know, issue a statement as to why they won't let it be considered by the Senate. Right now, because the House is controlled by Republicans, you know, know, prior to uh, the next changeover of Congress next month, Republicans can just say, oh, we're not going to consider it, um, or they can just refuse to answer anything about it. If it's passed, Republicans will really be put uh, under a harsh light. And have even more pressure to, you know, basically answer to this uh, level of accountability. So, no, I don't think it will be passed. I doubt it will be passed by the Senate, much less uh, signed by Trump. Uh, But the fact that it's being put into the national spotlight in such a visible way is really, really important. It's crucial. And it would allow those attacks to be made against Republicans come 2020 so that, you know, a reporter could say, well, you voted against protection for LGBTQ people. Why would you do that? Or you uh, allowed or you didn't speak up when Senator McConnell refused to bring up the uh, bill on the floor for a vote. So it's it's having that measure of accountability uh, that's really crucial for the next cycle of elections when we can win back the Senate and elect a, pre- a Democratic president and then, you know, finally pass the uh, Equality Act. 
It seems unlikely in our current political environment, but are there any Republicans in the Senate or the the House who are friendlier to these kinds of bills? It wasn't a lot to begin with, and it's dwindling by the year. I'll just say that. This is not the kind of environment where Republicans are usually willing to stick their neck out. (laughs) No, it's really not. Uh, The Republican Party has not just veered, but lurched to the right. And I don't think they feel they have to be accountable to anyone. I wish that I could say that 2018 was a wake-up call for the Republican Party, but I don't think that's going to happen this time, at least not in the immediate aftermath of uh, the you know, Trump disaster of his presidency and the uh, Mueller investigation, whatever the result of that comes. So a lot of the things that you were listing in various states are sort of bigger things, you know, really big things like losing your job or not being able to adopt. But I imagine there are a number of smaller things that especially trans and non-binary people need to deal with uh, that could be even in states that are considered fairly liberal, fairly friendly uh, to LGBT, that, uh, you know, that there are still things that, that need to be addressed. And so one thing I'm thinking, for instance, is driver's licenses and things like that. Can you talk to some of those issues and and things that maybe aren't always good, possible, friendly for uh, for people, you know, even in otherwise liberal places. You know, just the day to day lives of LGBTQ people are you know made much more difficult by these little things that cisgender and straight people never think about. I think IDs are a great example. The process for getting a gender marker on your ID that aligns with your gender identity can be a headache. Uh, getting your passport uh, changed, you know, getting your birth certificate changed. These are little things that matter not only for identification, but issues of safety. So that if you're in a workplace that could be hostile and someone finds out that you're transgender, it could open you up to acts of violence or, you know, vile discrimination. Are there states, are there places where things, you know, are there sort of examples of places that are doing things especially well right now? Well, and and I I say this with great respect to the people who, you know, may live in these respective states, because if you ask on the ground activists in any state, they're going to have issues with the government. There is no state absolutely beyond perfect on LGBTQ issues. But I will say that there are states who are ahead of the curve. D.C. is absolutely one. You know, the uh, level of equality for D.C. is uh, incredibly high, especially for trans folks. California is a great one. Massachusetts, uh, which just beat back a referendum to limit trans rights. The Human Rights Campaign, we we issue a report annually called the State Equality Index, and it grades every state on their level of equality for LGBTQ people. And so you can actually look up how we graded your state. So say you live in Texas, which is where I'm from. Um, You can look it up and you'll see that Texas isn't doing so great in the LGBTQ arena. And it will itemize the, the reasons why you know, the uh, level of safety that children can expect in schools, the, uh, you know, uh, laws that prevent discrimination for things like getting, you know, a driver's license that aligns with your gender identity. All these things are itemized in the report. And that's important because it gives not only citizens a full view of how their fellow citizens are being treated, uh, but it also, you know, ensures that lawmakers are held accountable for their lack of action on LGBTQ quality. Can we talk about healthcare? So I work in the healthcare sector, and I know that there are huge disparities for gay people and trans people in healthcare, and those have been only made worse by the HHS memo that came out, um, I believe, a few months ago that is just blatantly discriminatory towards trans people. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about things that we could be doing politically to help um, improve access to healthcare for LGBTQ people. Yeah, so Sophie's talking about a um, regulation that's been proposed by the Department of Health and Human Services that would essentially allow healthcare professionals in any capacity, whether it's um, a doctor, a nurse, or any other healthcare professional, to deny healthcare to patients on the basis of their religious beliefs, which basically means, um, in a roundabout way, discriminated against LGBTQ people saying that uh, you don't want to provide care because a uh, patient is, you know, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, could even be for things like, you know, this patient sought an abortion or is in the midst of seeking an abortion. 
And even though the care is not directly related to that, uh, I still want to deny it to her because I don't uh, agree with abortion uh, under my religious beliefs. And so it completely removes the whole, you know, ethics of the hypocrite oath uh, in which, you know, care must be provided no, no matter what. And it inserts religion into a place where religion should never be. Uh, you know, I am a committed Christian. I, my faith is very important to me. But my religion does not belong in the public square. And no religion belongs uh, in any place where a person's right and their livelihood could be compromised by another person's religious beliefs. I mean, that's completely absurd. And so what HHS is trying to do is insert this rule that would allow healthcare workers to deny that. And that's just not that's not just like things like, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to give you a Band-Aid. That's even life-saving health care. So a doctor could, you know, sensibly decline to uh, perform heart surgery on a patient because they don't want to, you know, work with a, uh, a patient who's gay or transgender. So we're seeing this proposal uh, and once it hits the federal register, there will be what's called a common period. And that's like, um, you know, to, uh, any, anywhere from 30 to 90 days in which the public will be able to submit comments on why that regulation should not be implemented. And that's where, you know, ordinary folks come in, right? That's where it's important that we get people submitting comments, calling the members of Congress and ensuring they know that, you know, this is something that should not be implemented. Also with that is that, you know, Trump and Pence uh, created this so-called office of, I, I forget the exact name of it, actually, um, but it's like the Office of Conscience Protection or something to that effect, which was essentially created to have like a, a civil rights task force that protects people who essentially will use this regulation to deny life-saving health care or any kind of health care. And so that if a healthcare worker, for example, says, you know, I don't want to provide this care because the person's gay or transgender, uh, and they get pushback, this office of, of, of conscience, the division of conscience regulation or whatever the hell, would sweep in and provide them with legal support in order to do that. It's really scary. This is kind of hands made to tell territory here. Sophie, do you want to talk more about that, being a healthcare professional? Yeah, I just, I work for a healthcare IT company, and I specifically work on sex and gender issues in healthcare, and it is difficult because some of the things that are best for patients are sometimes not taken up by healthcare organizations that are run by or managed by certain religious organizations. And so it can be quite a battle because many religious organizations say that they will not, for example, show preferred names. They'll only show legal names. They won't. Perf they won't show gender identity. Uh, they'll only show sex assigned at birth in a legal medical record, until it is mandated by law. And so, one of the things I would like to see is it mandated by law. And the HHS memo is not helping that argument that we are trying to make to these organizations. That's sort of where I was coming from with that. Oh, yeah. No, no, absolutely. I mean, you can obviously be someone on the ground who is a professional in the healthcare space. You can definitely speak to that a lot more saliently than I do. Uh, have you witnessed discrimination in the healthcare space, by the way? I wouldn't say I have witnessed any overt discrimination. I would say I have witnessed discussions that make it clear that one person does think that a patient or a co-worker's uh, chosen name is their quote-unquote real name or that their gender identity is their quote-unquote real gender and that's pretty uncomfortable and um yeah. frustrating because we have study after study that, sh that you know their chosen name and you know understanding and inviting their gender identity is like a vital to care, to providing care to everyone. And so it's very frustrating sometimes, you know, to see people unwilling to do very simple things that we know are good for patients and good for our, you know, society. Um, yeah. That's well said. Yeah. And, I, you know, I suspect it's a combination of sort of outright malice, but also in a lot of places sort of not wanting to either invest the money in changing systems or the time and energy in learning new systems. I mean, 
this affects all manner of things in in healthcare record keeping, right? So my sons mm-hmm. both have hyphenated last name. They they share a last name. That's you know my husband's name and mine hyphenated, and in one of their records it has a hyphen, and the other one it does not have a hyphen, and it's because they had changed systems between the births of the two kids, and they can't reconcile the two systems somehow, and and there's like no way to fix this, and so every time I have to call, I have to remember which one has a hyphen and which one doesn't in the system, and you know, and this is a very minor thing that I have to remember, but it, you know, it it points to the the kinds of things that are sort of baked in in a way that that makes change very uh very difficult you know it, mm-hmm. and uh clearly if i have trouble with this minor little detail of a name that's got to affect all sorts of people in all sorts of ways that are you know much more problematic than what i have to deal with with you know a simple remembering who has the hyphen mm-hmm. and it's interesting that in my experience, it's not often the doctors or the nurses or even like the administrators at a healthcare organization that are pushing back against, you know, recognizing people's gender identity. It's usually some like, you know, sort of outside group that owns or manages the healthcare system, usually, you know, a religious order of some kind. And so they're making these policies sort of from on high. And then the people on the ground are having being forced to sort of like work around them to provide decent care to patients. And it can be frustrating to see people who are not actually working on the ground with patients making these rules that aren't in anybody's best interest. So what are some of the ways then that we can be good allies to LGBTQ people that that we can make sure, you know, for those of us who who don't face some of these issues, that we're mindful of them, that we're advocating for either legal policies or just, you know, on the ground asking our doctor's office to make sure that, that they're doing things? You know, yeah, I mean, the, the spectrum of things that good allies can do is is so big. It spans from, you know, the the more intensive stuff like you know, organizing on the ground, um, campaigning, things like that, to the everyday stuff that you can do that doesn't take much effort at all. So I'll start with the more intense stuff, which, you know, is voting, right? Registering to vote, making sure that your friends are registered to vote, that they're getting out to vote, you know, doing things like, you know, organizing for local ballot initiatives or candidates who support equality uh, initiatives. And then there is the more day-to-day stuff, Um, things like, you know, respecting people's pronouns, knowing that there are questions that you shouldn't ask uh, trans people, that for some reason, you know, a lot of cis people think it's totally fine to ask a trans person about their surgeries or um, very personal questions about, and, you know, within like two minutes of knowing them, you know, if they date men or women, for example, These are little things that could be easily mitigated if allies uh, made more of an effort to research them. I find that there's a lot of wonderful, well-meaning, lovely people who are honestly really good people who message me and ask me to teach them about trans stuff. And I don't have the time to do that, quite frankly. It would be so much easier if they simply go to Google.com and enter, how do I respect trans people? Or what does it mean to be transgender? And all of these wonderful links will pop up that teach them these things. I I am not opposed to teaching. I am, you know, certainly not opposed to participating in conversations like this one that are productive. But it's not, it's not something that I can do every day. It's not something that a trans person or any LGBTQ person can do every day. Uh, Or for that matter, you know, women or people of color, uh, or religious minorities. It's funny because I, I honestly did not know, I didn't really know what it meant to be white until I came out as transgender. And what I mean by that is when I came out as trans, I found that there was a lot of labor that I did not anticipate, which you know was basically people asking me to educate them or you know sometimes debate you know my my humanity with them. And this is something that people of color are asked to do almost every day in this country on some level. 
And I just never occurred to me that that was a thing until uh, I started, you know, uh, you know, coming out and, you know, negotiating the, the basically, basically the loss of privilege that I had in coming out as transgender. And it made me think of all the times as a white ally when I failed to do the labor myself and instead put it on the people of color in my life to teach me. And it made me super, super aware of my white privilege um, in ways that I just did not anticipate. It was, you know, being trans has been mm. an enormous lesson in allyship that I didn't expect. Do you know if there are good books aimed at children. So I have a seven and four year old sons. Sophie has a two year old son. And it, it's something I think a lot about, you know, I, uh, obviously, we try to raise our children to be respectful and inclusive and, it, you know, all of those things. But I like to make sure that I specifically talk about issues and don't just assume that, you know, be a good person is gonna cover everything. Do you know if there are children's books that are good at, you know, explaining, teaching about LGBTQ issues or about respecting people with, you know, who who may seem different than you. I, I don't know if children's literature is a thing that you look at much, but... <laughs> it isn't, to be honest. I, I think there are people who could answer this question a lot better than I can. But there is a really great book that recently came out called I Am Jazz. And it's a children's book about a transgender child. And it talks about what it means to be jazz, this child who is transgender and uh, what their life is like. It's really great. You know, HRC as an organization has hosted several events about this book. Uh, Sarah McBride, our, one of our national spokespeople, has gone on tour uh, in support of it. And it's and again, it's it's something that, you know, you would be shocked by the amount of resources that are available at your fingertips. And this is this, this is not directed at you, by the way. But this is more just everyone. Like, uh, you know, Google takes all of five seconds. If I go to Google right now, I can just type in, you know, good books, uh, good kid books for um, LGBTQ issues. And there will be lists that pop up uh, of titles that are, you know, available at your public library. So it's, uh, it's a lot of great stuff out there. And I Am Jazz is especially potent. I think it actually won an award this past year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'll have to look for that. What you know, I've noticed among my friends increasingly is uh, it, it, people with kids, you know, in the age range of of my kids who are being more accepting of their children exploring gender, which I think has been really powerful. You know, I I have several friends whose whose kids even at a very young age have felt comfortable with you know, playing with gender, boys wearing dresses and painting nails. And, you know, I I think it's always been more sort of accepted the other way, girls being tomboyish. Um, I certainly was as a kid. But, you know, I think that that's been really powerful. And as I think as our kids grow up with more acceptance of that, hopefully that will help them be more accepting as they become older, uh, both of you know, themselves and of uh, other people in the world. But I'm also very aware that I sort of exist in a liberal bubble and <laughs> that that's almost certainly not what's happening around the country. Well, you know, I, I think it's important for people to realize that healthy kids are going to explore with things. You know, there are a lot of kids who experiment with gender very early on. And it turns out that they were always cisgender. They just wanted to try this other thing out and see what it felt like. Now, that doesn't mean that we can use that as an attack on transgender kids to say that this is a phase or uh, that they get used to it or they needed to be converted back. But the best thing we can do as adults, and especially as parents, and I, I say that with a bit of humility because I am not a parent, is create an environment in which we encourage kids just be themselves, be themselves and not shame them for any kind of performative nature. So, you know, if there's a if there's a little boy who is, you know, really into dump trucks and, you know, playing soldier and all that, let let him play with that. As long as you teach him to respect others and to treat others with uh, dignity and love, that's all that matters. Uh, and it's the same way with, uh, you know, uh, a little boy who wants to experiment with more feminine, uh, traditionally feminine things, or a girl who wants to experiment with traditionally masculine things. 
So are there particular uh, political issues, particular laws that may be coming up for votes in various places that you would like us to make sure that we are paying attention to right now? Well, here's the thing. This legislative session has come to an end. Mm -hmm. So most of the vote, I mean, I don't I don't know of any votes in state legislatures that are up. We're not going to really see any bills come to the floor until next month. But what I would look out for, uh, for listeners of, of your podcast, is wherever they live, check out what the state legislature is introducing that pertains to LGBTQ rights. Uh, some states, I'm sure, introduce bills that try to ban conversion therapy, which is a, an extremely harmful practice that attempts to uh, convert kids, uh, quote unquote, convert kids from homosexual to heterosexual uh, through abusive means. It's important that we support legislation that bans that practice and, uh, of course, you know, uh, fight against legislation that would seek to legalize it. Things like, you know, fighting for non-discrimination protections at the state and local level. So if your city has a non-discrimination ordinance that comes up, you know, go to your city council meeting and, and make sure your voice is heard. Tell your, you know, city council people that you want to make sure that this is passed. And that all residents, uh, LGBTQ or otherwise, are protected under the same law, that they can't be discriminated against because of who they are or who they love. If you invite me back in a month, I think I will definitely have a list of bills that are going to need to be addressed. But, you know, part of citizenry is that you got to want it. you got to do the the research. And I I say that as someone who does not have kids, by the way, because having kids is is a full-time job, as we all know. But even taking 10 minutes just out of your day. And going to, you know, the part of your local paper where it talks about what's going on at the state capitol or the state government, it can be really helpful to understand, you know, what's being done to not only LGBTQ people, but people of color, you know, women, especially with reproductive rights, uh, undocumented immigrants, religious minorities. All these communities can be either protected or attacked by our state legislatures. And so just a little, just a little bit of effort in understanding what's at stake and what's introduced into your, you know, state government can be helpful. Other than your Twitter feed, are there other Twitter feeds that people should follow to make sure that they uh, are alerted to these sorts of things? Ton. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where to start. Well, I would, I would, of course, begin with two broads talking politics, right? <laughs> uh, that's where you should start. It depends on what you're interested in. You know, I like to cultivate a list of journalists to follow. You know, one person that I like following is Dave Weigel. Sometimes I disagree with his takes, but I find that he is one of the more reporters out there. He really kind of holds all, you know, sides of an issue to the fire to see, you know, what ticks. I think Dave is just incredibly fair in his assessments. He does mess up sometimes, as we as we all do, but I really like how he approaches politics on a national level. I would say in terms of politicians, uh, bitter work. Um, he has a way of being proudly progressive while also building bridges, which I think as of two years ago, a lot of people would tell you was not possible. But we saw that he ran his campaign in Texas with fire, but he didn't do it by compromising uh, progressive values, which is important. In terms of celebrities in general, I like Alyssa Milano. She has worked her ass off over the last year and a half on so many different issues. I mean, it started out with women's rights. And then before I knew it, she was working on, you know, gun reform and uh, the rights of immigrants and LGBTQ rights. She is someone who I don't think sleeps. She's a good friend of mine. And I worry about just the severe lack of sleep she must have. (laughs) But she has a great feed. I feel like anyone who just wants like a one-on-one on liberal politics that they should be watching Go to her feed. Like she, she publishes articles across the spectrum on all sorts of issues that pertain to um, what's important. What's important to us as a liberal movement. I should make a list actually of just Twitter accounts to follow. What about y'all? Like, what, what are some accounts that I should be following? Oh gosh, I mean, a, a lot of those uh, definitely 
<laughs> so I'm deeply interested in electoral politics. So I've been following a list that Nate Rakich, who writes for 538, cultivated that's called Uncalled Election Results. <laughs> Yeah. And mm-hmm. it, so that's how I got alerted very early to like what's going on in the North Carolina Ninth District and and that sort of thing, because it's a, a lot of the the reporters on the ground in these various places. One person who I think uh, we had on, who I think is a, a really excellent follow on Twitter, is uh, uh, on Twitter he goes by Daniel. It's like Daniel but with a T. His his name is Daniel Nishanian, but he uh, is always looking very deep dive into uh, legislation and elections that are on the ballot uh, that are affecting sort of a a whole host of issues. Uh, But he looks a lot at things like criminal justice. And so I, you know, he's a a really great person to sort of notice a lot of these things that are coming up that, that you might not otherwise catch, you know, as early as he is. So, so those are great. But uh, I mean, Alyssa certainly is fantastic <laughs> to follow. Yeah, absolutely. I, I and mean, you know, if you gave me if you gave me like a day, I could probably you know drop a list of five hundred people that everyone should immediately follow, or or organizations or what have you. I do think it's important to search out new people or new organizations to keep track of. You know, every now and then, um, not not even every now and then, probably a few hours every week, I will surf Twitter and kind of just see who's out there who I haven't been paying attention to. I follow some people who not a lot of folks know about, but they'll say something really smart that will catch my eye. And they might have like 300 followers and I'll start following them and, and really appreciate their insight into issues. I think being open to different perspectives is obviously very important. That's not the same thing as both sides, which I, I cannot stand that approach to life. Uh, this thing that, you know, just because uh, someone differs from you means that you have to uh, listen to what they have to say. And I, I don't agree with that at all. I, I really get irritated by this growing narrative, this so-called um, tribalism language, which is essentially that America has turned into a bunch of tribes. And that people have siloed themselves and that we all need to come together. And that's bullshit, quite frankly. We're not, it's not tribalism. It's, it is people who are viciously racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, xenophobic, and wear their bigotry and hatred on their sleeve. And it's the rest of us. And the tribalism language is meant to kind of smooth that over and make other people feel better. I think there are a lot of folks in this country who are liberal or moderate, but just don't want the headache of having these uncomfortable conversations or having a heightened political atmosphere that would ensure that, you know, the rights of the vulnerable are protected. And it bothers me when I see them try to shut debate down or stymie uh, discussions because it makes them uncomfortable. We need to embrace those moments that make us uncomfortable. That's when the good stuff happens. That's when we have honest exchanges about what it means to be an American. We've always been divided. We've always had these issues that have divided us uh, for quite a long time. The only difference between now and then is that they're becoming more visible. Uh, visible. You know, even, even in eras when it seemed like America was a, a Rockefeller uh, dream, like, uh, say, Eisenhower in the 50s or Reagan in the 80s or even Clinton in the 90s, there was a great deal of oppression occurring underneath the mainstream, uh, whether it was people of color or LGBTQ people or women. And so those Americas that are so out, so often lauded for being, you know, periods of great growth and prosperity were not that way for everybody on the basis of race, gender, sexuality, religion, et cetera. And I think the sooner that we come to terms with that and recognize that in order for us to be a great America, everyone has to be included the better off we'll be. But we can't continue this this rather bullshit uh, approach of saying, I'm uncomfortable, and because I'm uncom- un- uncomfortable, everyone else needs to shut up about the oppression they're, they're going through and, and be quiet so that we can get, get, get back to a place where we're all, quote unquote, getting along. Yes. Several not so well-meaning people perhaps on Twitter recently have asked me to stop making everything about sexism. <laughs> Oh, God, yeah. I was like, well, if you stop being sexist, maybe I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
no, no, keep, actually keep talking about that. I'd love to hear more. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, it, it's happened to have been democratic white men, you know, and what they're saying seems to be that if we make everything about sexism, we can't focus on the quote unquote real issues. It's like, well, what, what are the issues that matter if women don't matter? <laughs> like, I, I, I'm a little bit confused uh, <laughs> what's going on here. I found that I'm much more willing than I had been in the past to just keep pushing back. And, you know, in instead of sort of backing down and going, oh, well, okay, I see your point or something, you know, that that I keep then pushing them and, and saying, well, you know, I, I'm not making this about sexism. Me calling it out does is not the problem. <laughs> the the problem is there whether or not I'm calling it out. And, and it's not the only thing I'm going to call out. I'm not making everything about sexism. Some things are about racism or homophobia. You know, I, I've had a couple of these conversations recently. And, and there was, you know, one guy that I kind of got to a point where he understood what I was saying, and I understood what he was saying. He did then say, well, you should have framed it that way. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not framing it the way you think I should have framed it. The other guy eventually blocked me, um, <laughs> which I took as a win. I was like, that's fine. <laughs> I, yeah. I argued you into submission. Uh, but, you know, I I think that there there is something going on where there are people who feel uh, attacked personally by things when they're sort of forced to confront their own biases. And, you know, I, I understand that I have certainly gone through moments of awakening where I have realized that there were things that I was doing or thinking that, you know, had some bias to them. And it's a difficult thing. It's hard to realize that about yourself. But the correct response is not to then attack the messenger. Exactly. I, I think what also is true is this very strange dynamic from a lot of white male progressives who believe that in order to win elections, we need to avoid alienating essentially middle class middle America white male voters. So what I think that means is that, you know, you're going to see Bernie talk a lot, a lot less about white supremacy. That's for damn sure. Um, and LGBTQ issues. And while he may talk about abortion rights, he probably won't talk a lot about sexism. I think Bernie is hedging his bets on the idea that he can convince folks in middle America that their lack of protections under our current economic system should be enough to galvanize them and into a, a win for Democrats. The problem with that is that it alienates all the folks who have always been with Democrats, particularly black women who come out for Democratic candidates in overwhelming force, but who saw a failure to address their own issues from Bernie in 2016. And by the way, if Bernie's our nominee, I will campaign my heart out for him. I will do everything in my power to ensure that Bernie Sanders is elected president if he gets our nomination. But until then, he has a responsibility during the primary process to ensure that vulnerable communities are addressed and that we are not political tips to be bargained away in order to elect him president. All right. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to make sure we talked about? We, we've talked about a lot. <laughs> no, I I have really loved this conversation, and I am so grateful for what you two do. I think that you know more women should be talking about everything political, and certainly you know creating and spreading uh, podcasts that you know put our dialogue out there. I think that. You know, and this has become a cliche as of late, but I really do think the future is female. The future is made up of women in leadership. And the more that we support women in leadership, the more we're going to see the tide turned against this, you know, vicious uh, movement of hatred and bigotry. So I really appreciate what y'all do. And I thank you for that. And I'm just really honored to be on this program. Well, thank you so much for for coming on and for everything that you do and if you make that Twitter list, I will subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? Off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri. And we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast.